So one of the weird things um, about speaking is you, in order to get better at it, you hire all these coaches and whatever, and all of them give me the exact same advice, which is that you should never start a speech by saying, I'm excited to be here today. Because immediately your audience will think, well, what's the alternative? <laughs> you're angry to be here. You're disappointed that you're here. Um, but I am legitimately excited to be here. So my story, really quick in a nutshell, I was a full-time professor at the business school at ORU. Um, I started writing books. Uh, actually, I started writing articles, and people started reading them. Then I started writing books, and people started reading them. And then invitations to go all over the place um, started coming in. But very rarely did they ever come from Tulsa, uh, which is a shame, because I'm not, I, I won't say I'm a native Tulsa, and I got here as quick as I can. I've lived here for almost two decades. And I am aware of the amazing things that are going on in the city of Tulsa, of the amazing things that are going on in the state of Oklahoma, and nobody's talking about them. Or to the extent that they are, it's little things like, oh, we'll pay you $10,000 to move to Tulsa, and then the news media is like, well, where's, where's Tulsa? Where are we getting paid for it, et cetera? Um, and I don't think that. I think we're moving into an era where people are actually going to start looking not just to Tulsa, but to a lot of these, I call them B-list cities, right? Because talent is smart, and they've figured out that they can go to work anywhere, and that places that are low cost of living but good people, fundamentally good people, are, are create better companies and better places to work. And so I think the whole sort of talent flock to, to cities, et cetera, that we've seen over numbers of years is in the midst of reversing, and we get to be there on the front lines. And so to come and talk to a lot of different organizations from Tulsa is super exciting. The other reason it's exciting is I've written three books now, and every time I've tried to sneak an Oklahoma story into every one of them. Um, and so it's fun to take, take all of those back home. Um, I, won't, I won't list any of the companies today because I'm too afraid that competitive companies and things like that might be here. So we won't, we won't talk about those examples. But it's fun to tell those stories, and so it's exciting to come home. So despite the advice of all of the best Coaches, I am really excited to be here. Thank you all so much for having me. I want to set a guiding idea for today's talk. And the guiding idea is actually really, really simple. It's how it gets implemented that is difficult. Of course, that's the case with almost everything. The guiding idea is this, that great leaders don't innovate the product. They innovate the factory. We talk a lot about innovative products and services. I wrote my whole first book, it was called The Mist of Creativity. It was about how do you bring more innovation to an organization. And it created this setup that usually when we have a groundbreaking innovation in a product or service or a totally new innovative business model, usually that happens after a set of leaders have looked at the way that they manage their people. I'll use factory here as a metaphor for anywhere work gets done. Usually the most innovative ideas for products, services, business models, et cetera, come after a leader has decided to change some things about the way they interact with their people, and then the people are set free to be more innovative. So great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. And by the way, this has been true. This isn't like a new thing, like, oh, the world has suddenly changed in the last 18 months or whatever. This isn't a new thing. This is actually 100 years old. So as I said, I, I was a full-time business school professor. Uh, I'm still technically a professor, but only when, when Meg decides to ditch her classes and have me join them. Um, and one of the stories that we teach is a story from 100 years ago about a, a struggling factory in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Bethlehem Ironworks. Now, Bethlehem Ironworks had two problems. The first was that they made steel. So there's a branding issue there. Right, that needs to get solved. The second is that they were making less and less of it. They were losing to bigger operations, to more efficient operations, and so they hired who would go down in history as being sort of the world's first management consultant. They hired a man to come and teach them how to do more with less. Has anybody ever felt like you have to do more with less every single day, right? And this, so this man came and basically took what would become super famous, a stopwatch and a pencil, and went to work looking at the entire factory, finding ways to innovate the factory. He timed every single step in the production process and every step as it was being done by the most efficient people. And what he was looking for was a set of norms, a set of standards that could say, this is the one best way to produce steel. And this, he got incredibly granular. Like To give you an idea of how granular he got, he discovered that at that time period, the average adult male the perfect shovel full of coal to be shoveled into a furnace for an eight hour shift was 17 and a half pounds. Just in case you're ever on Jeopardy and there's a question about the perfect, there you go. 
I mean, it's a totally random piece of information, but that's how detailed it was. And then further, he found that no, none of the shovels that were available actually held 17 and a half pounds each time. So he redesigned the shovel to care that this is the level of detail, right? Did it work for Bethlehem, uh, the newly rechristened Bethlehem steel? Yes, it did. It made their factories much more efficient. More importantly, he then wrote up his ideas in a book that became known as The Principles of Scientific Management. I'm talking about a man named Frederick Winslow Taylor. And everyone who's ever suffered through principles of management knows that name, right? Freddie suffered. No, suffered's a good word, Meg. Suffered's a fine word. Um, because Frederick Winslow Taylor, let's be honest, was called the, the father of modern management. But I like to think of him more as sort of like the deadbeat dad of modern management. Because the ideas were effective, but they're kind of a drag, right? I'll give you an idea of it. So Taylor wrote in the Principles of Scientific Management, the duty of enforcing the adoption of standards and enforcing this cooperation rests with management alone. Let me translate that from 1919 to 2019. What Taylor was writing was that there are two tiers of employees in a factory. There is management, and management's job is to figure out the standard. Management's job is to enforce the standard. Management's job is to think. And then there is labor, and labor's job is to do. And if you think that's a problem, we'll go get another human widget, right? Now, did it work for the factory? Yes. Taylor's ideas kick-started the Industrial Revolution. His book, Principles of Scientific Management, is still in print. This is my favorite cover of the like 21 different covers on Amazon because it adequately captures the nature of the cog in the machine idea. Taylor was never actually on Business Week, but devotees of Frederick Taylor started a magazine in the early 1900s called Standards. Standards grew, adopted, merged, acquired, et cetera, and is now known as Bloomberg Business Week. So much of what we read even today about business was influenced by, by Taylor. Most of what we know about even, even management books written today are based on Taylor's ideas, that there are two tiers. There's management and there's labor. Management's job is to figure it out. Labor's job is to execute. But there's a problem with those ideas. And the problem is this. Most of us have moved from a physical factory to what I call an idea factory. Most people, the, the, especially in the United States, most people are involved in service sector or creative sector jobs. They may not define it as that. They might even say, I still work in an actual factory. We make things. But the level of problem solving required is much bigger than in Taylor's day. Almost every employee these days is, is called upon to solve problems, to think creatively, and to generate ideas. But we dragged Taylor's rule book with us from the factory to the office. It, it, in fact, it's one of the reasons why we have shows like The Office, right? If you, if you ever think about, um, what if, or Dilbert, right? Or Office Space, for those of you fans of the Red Stapler. By the way, total, this is a free side note. You can actually buy Red Swingline Staplers on Amazon.com. I was looking it up the other day because I needed to buy one, and I just thought, if I'm going to spend all the money, I need to find that exact stapler, and I did. Some of you have never actually watched Office Space, and I can tell by the... Looks, those of you that have, just fill them in afterwards about what they're missing. But it's the reason. These sort of office satire places, they all point to the absurdity that we exist now using a rule book that was created for a 1900s factory in 2019. It creates some problems. Now, fortunately, there are companies that are really believing what Taylor believed, which is that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory, but realizing that Taylor isn't alive today to re-innovate how we do work. They're looking at what they're asking their employees to do, and they're looking at their own factories, metaphorical factories, the places where people are getting work done, and they're starting to change certain things. So today what I want to talk to you about is sort of that complete flow of talent. We'll just keep the factory metaphor going here, and we'll talk about the factory line of employment, from how do you acquire top talent and make sure that it's actually a fit, to how do you um, encourage, manage, let's say coach all of that talent to get better, what are, your, what are your obligations there? And then what happens when an employee wants to leave, which is always uh, a, an interesting discussion among ethics people, but we'll get into that a little bit later. What happens when talent moves on and how can we best respond to that so that we're constantly in a place where our talent feels like they can do their best work? We've moved from a physical factory to an idea factory, but the job of innovating that factory continues on with us. So, We'll start off with how do you um, acquire that talent, right? Now, most of us, right, when we think about hiring, we don't necessarily think about it as a team-based job, but that is um, increasing. Most of us, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Most of us, when we start the hiring process, we all use the same hiring process, right? Most of the time, it starts with what? 
right? It starts with a phone call. Um, or actually, I should say, it starts with uploading your resume to a website where it gets scanned for the perfect buzzwords or keywords or whatever you want to call it. And then assuming that that resume is good, we go to a phone call, right? And the phone call, in fact, in some organizations, it's not even a phone interview. It's called a phone, wow, everybody knew that one, right? Why? Because what's the goal of the phone screen? Well, I'm trying to screen out the people who are crazy, right? The, the, the crazies, the, the liars, the ne'er-do-wells. I've always loved that phrase, by the way, ne'er-do-well. How often do you do well? Ne'er. <laughs> I ne'er-do-well. Right? We're, trying to, we're trying to screen out all of those people, assuming it goes well. Then we sit down in that face-to-face -face interview. We come in, we, we sit down in the face-to-face -face interview, we, we talk for a little bit, and then if we feel good about it, right, what happens next? We go to that next round interview, we're gradually narrowing down the pie, right? It's actually, I mean, let's be honest, we're both putting on our, our super fake selves, right? We're trying to be the best version. It's basically like a first date, isn't it? Right, we have an hour to make the decision about whether or not we wanna go on a second date. Eventually in this process, if it goes well, we, we do what? We meet the parents, right? We go into an interview that is usually the hiring manager and his or her boss, right? Sometimes that's a ceremonial blessing type interview and sometimes that's the actual stress interview. Um, and we never like to tell people whether or not it is the stress interview or the ceremony because we wanna see how they perform and all of that. And then, then if it goes well, what do we do? We make them the offer, right? And then we start the negotiation. We propose and then we go right into the prenup, right? <clears throat> and then of course, then of course it doesn't work. Some of the time, most of the time, a lot of the time, it doesn't work. That person who was a perfect interviewer just doesn't work out. They don't click with people, they're not actually performing well, they can't actually figure out that work starts at 9 a.m., pretty much the same time every day, right? They can't figure those things out. And then we have to, we're faced with the decision to, um, what's the right term? Jaleesha, what did we decide on last week? Oh, then we have to decide whether or not we want to share them with our competition. It didn't work out, so we're gonna have to invite them to be successful in some other organization. Uh, my friend Arthur Greeno, he manages two of the Chick-fil-A's here. Being Chick-fil-A, he's got a great term for this. He actually uses the term, I'm going to upgrade them to customer status. <laughs> because you know they're coming back for the chicken sandwich, so I'm just upgrading them to customer status. They'll be back, they just won't get paid. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this phenomenon, they, they interviewed well, everything seemed great, and then they don't work out. This phenomenon happens in, in almost every industry. In fact, a couple months ago, I was speaking to a group of people that are um, investment advisors, registered investment advisors, the people that, that um, help individuals with personal finance choose which mutual funds to pick, et cetera. And I asked them, you know, how often does this happen? And every single person in the room raised their hand, and I stopped and I thought, if ever there was a room full of people that know that past performance is not indicative of future results. It would be people who work with investments. And yet we make this, I don't get why they didn't work out. Their resume looked great. Did you ever consider that past performance is not indicative of future results? What then is past performance indicative? Well, there's, there are organizations that are moving a little bit differently to the way they find talent and reducing this number. I wish I could tell you I have a silver bullet for making the right hiring decision every time, but I'm not trying to sell you a high level consulting package, so I won't tell you that. What I can tell you is how to shorten the odds and make a little bit better decision. To give you that example, I want to use um, an organization that uh, I'm in love with and they're in love with my paycheck, uh, Whole Foods Market. Uh, my son has a bunch of food allergies and so they make everything so much easier to find in that situation. And Whole Foods, pre-acquisition Whole Foods, a couple things have, have changed since the Amazon acquisition, but Whole Foods, when it was started and through most of their growth, runs on teams. Even the CEO position is actually a three-person co-CEO trinity, for lack of a better term. <laughs> and and in, in, even in that situation, it's run on teams. In fact, new employees, when they're hired, have to get used to this term, this, this document that they have to internalize called their declaration of interdependence. We realize that everybody is interdependent. And I'm not just talking about teams like the, the meat department over here and produce and, and et cetera. I'm talking about even at the regional level, even at the home office level, everything runs on teams. And so Whole Foods very quickly morphed to a situation where they were looking at the whole team to make that hiring decision. But they still wanted to employ the, empower the individual manager. So here's what their system looks like. It's a little bit different. Starts with that phone call again, the phone, screen, making sure they're not ne'er-do-wells. 
come in for an interview with the store manager. If the store manager decides that you um, might be a good fit for them, then she places you on a team and you go to work. And after 30 to 60 days, depending on the position, depending on home office versus whatever, after 30 to 60 days, the team votes on whether or not you get to stay on that team. Some of you are looking at me like, that's so mean. That sounds like Survivor. <laughs> well, there's a good reason for that. It's exactly like Survivor <laughs> or any other reality TV show. And it, it sounds like it might be a recipe for drama, but it's actually not. John Mackey, the co-CEO of, of, of Whole Foods for a long time, said this. A team doesn't fully gel until it doesn't vote somebody on the team. That's a weird sentence. A team doesn't fully gel until it doesn't vote somebody on the team. What Mackey is saying is that teams decide amongst themselves what standard they're going to hold each other accountable to. We as orga whole organizations decide these are our standards of performance. This is our standard of ethics, for example, or this is our standard of accountability we have to each other. And when a person joins the team and they are here, if you allow that person to stay, well, then you're lying about this. Your standard's down here. You're just in denial. And so what John Mackey is saying is a team doesn't fully realize what its standards of accountability, what its standards of performance, that it doesn't fully realize what it is to be a member of that team until they find somebody who just isn't a fit and decide that it can't work for them. Now, it take, you have to be a, a large non-fit, right? They use the, pretty much the, the same standard of impeachment, right? It takes a two-thirds majority vote to get somebody off the team, right? So it's not just a simple, if, if two or three people are mad, you're gone. Um, it takes a large number of people to vote you off the team. And the manager at that point can decide uh, whether or not, in this case, inviting you to be successful somewhere else means another department in that area, maybe referring you to a different store, maybe it's just an interpersonal fit. The manager can still decide. But this idea that how you fit on the team matters is hugely important at all levels at Whole Foods. And so the team decides whether or not you get to say. Now, to understand why this works so well, we have to think about um, a lot of our misconceptions about individual performance and individual talent. To do that, we'll leave the grocery store for a second and go to the trading floor. Actually, not the, the trading floors of Wall Street, but the offices above those trading floors where uh, in investment analysts do their work. And a research study by a man, it's a brilliant name, by the way, a 10-year-long research study by a man named Boris Groisberg. Boris Gore, isn't that a great name? It's a professor name, if ever there was one, right? You can see the elbow patches when I just say <laughs> Boris Groisberg. Boris is, is, a, is a brilliant man, super humble man, does indeed wear elbow patches. And what I love about him is when I talk about his research, I sound smarter, right? You can too, take it, right? Just remember, whatever you're going to talk about for the rest of the day, just say, well, according to Boris Groisberg's research, and you'll just sound smarter, it works. There's a, a trick for you for the day. So Groisberg wondered, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon that goes on in the world that institutional investment um, analysts. So you have these people that work for investment banks. They write reports on uh, what is going on in the industry or what's going on in two or three of the top companies. Uh, all of those things are synthesized and, and handed off to different institutional investors who make decisions on uh, what to buy, what to sell, et cetera, for pension programs, mutual funds, all of that sort of thing. Now, this community of institutional investors actually has a trade magazine. It's, it's called, well, it's called the Institutional Investor. They're not the most creative group. I mean, it's called Institutional Investor, and every year, this magazine ranks who are the top analysts. Based on a survey of the people making the buy and sell decisions, who are the people that gave you the best quality information over the last year? And you get ranked uh, first, second, third, and an honorable mention. And you can imagine when you're ranked on this, this is a good thing for your career. And the phone starts to ring. It's not you looking for a job. It's other investment banks looking to offer you a job. Sometimes these firms will pay half a million, three quarters of a million, a million dollars a year to that perfect institutional investor because they feel like there'll be a long-term benefit. And some of the time, that person transitions over. And so Groisberg wanted to study what happens when the most talented analysts in an investment bank move from one firm to another. Is it actually worth acquiring that talent? To do that, he looked at almost 1,100 analysts for nine years. These analysts were stationed at 24 different investment banks. And then after he crunched the data, he did about a, uh, over 150 hours of interviews to get the idea behind why is this working, what's working, et cetera. And what he found is this. When one firm poaches talent from another firm, right, says you worked great over here, we're going to pick you up and move you um, over here because we want to acquire that talent, 
when, when that star moves from one company to another, three things happen most often. The first is that the performance of the actual star declines. That person that we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for, their, for his or her talent, their performance actually declines. The performance of the group that that person is put on, the team that they're now a part of, declines. Right? And overall, in the long term, the valuation of the company decreases. Now, any basketball fans in here? You can probably think of a million examples of how this works, right? Why? Because one ball, right? Doesn't matter how many stars, one ball. It's actually the same here. In Groisberg's research, he found there was only one type of transition where these things didn't happen. He called it the lift out. A lift out is when you're a talented investment analyst, we want to bring that talent into our firm, so we're gonna take your whole team and hire all of them and move them over to our firm so that we can benefit. So what Groisberg found is that as much as we love to think about ourselves as amazing, talented, brilliant individuals, a majority of our performance in almost any knowledge work job is actually dependent upon the team that we're on, the resources the company provides us, and how well of a fit we are. Team talent and individual performance are in, in, inextricably linked, right? And, and only like the, the most narcissistic people, investment analysts, people who work on Wall Street, makes sense, um, only those people would deny otherwise. Team talent and individual performance are linked. And so if we think back to what's going on at a company like Whole Foods, okay, you're not gonna lift it out. You're not gonna go like, well, Kroger, you've got a great meat department. We're just gonna hire that whole department, move them over to our store. You, you can't, I mean, I guess actually you could do that, uh, but you don't. But you still want to know whether or not, if individual performance is dependent on the team that you're on, you still want to know whether or not this person is a good fit for the team and whether or not the team is a good fit for this new person's talent. And if it's not necessarily a good fit, then you probably shouldn't make the deal or you should find them the right team. You should literally invite them to be successful somewhere else. It sounds mean, but I mean, it sounds like a joking euphemism, but it's actually not in a lot of cases. Life is short. Why would you want to do work on a team that hates you, right? So it works in both cases. Now, Whole Foods isn't the only firm that's doing this. Um, one of my favorite firms in the universe, a company called Automatic. Automatic, you've probably never heard of, but they run a product called WordPress. Has anyone by chance been on the internet today? On the interwebs, dialed into the World Wide Web? Anybody, nobody? <laughs> nobody? You all have your phones in airplane mode, don't you? Good, thank you. Okay, well, if you've been on the internet at any point today, there's a one in four chance you've been on a website that runs on WordPress on the back end. WordPress powers about 28% uh, of the internet. Uh, it powers my website, so I'm a fan of it. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing company. It's a geographically dispersed company. Their employees work all over the world. There is no necessarily home office. I guess the home office is wherever their CEO, Matt Mullenweg, is that day. And what uh, WordPress does is they have a lot of engineers that want to come to work for them. And if they seem like a fit, right, if they make it past the phone screen, then they're invited to join a trial. And a trial is we're going to actually, if you're working with customer service, we're going to put you on the phone with real customers. We'll train you. If you're working in tech and you're coding and developing, we're going to give you uh, security access to actually let you edit real code. We're going to put you on a team. We're going to do it on a contractor basis, full time if there's a health insurance type of reason. And we're going to do it for about eight weeks, not unlike Whole Food and voting. The interesting thing here with the trial is that after the trial, the, the interview process is not considered over until the trial is done. Feedback from the team that you're on is solicited. It's forwarded to Matt Mullenweg. It's a, it is a smaller organization, one that the, the CEO and owner can still uh, make the final hiring decision. But here's what I think is interesting. Matt takes all of that feedback and then he goes into that final round interview, which is conducted via chat room. Yeah, you remember those? like America Online, CompuServe, chat room, right? He does it via text. And I asked him about this, and Matt said, well, I'm not actually, the reason I do it via text is there's all of these nonverbal things that that person and I could click or not click with that would sway my judgment, and I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in how well they worked on the team that they were actually assigned to. That tells me way more. I've got a couple questions for them, but I don't want my own biases to persuade me to make a yes or no decision. I care much more about the team. And so with the team's feedback goes into that final round interview and then the trial is either a success or a failure based mostly on that feedback and a couple questions from Matt. Um, they're not the only firm uh, that, that does this again, not even automatic. Firm you might have heard of, has, I mean if you were on the internet today there's a one in one chance that you probably <laughs> use this firm. 
Google has for a, a long time had a system. They actually were, for the longest time, had a reputation for having way too many interviews. They gradually cut it down, but what I think is really important in this whole process, from resume screen to interviews with hiring managers, peers, cross-functional managers, they include, a lot of times, interviews with future subordinates. In other words, we believe you'll be in a management position one day. And so we want some people who might end up being your subordinates or who are subordinates of an, of an existing manager now, we want their input too. It's not just about the hiring manager that's gonna manage you making the decision. It's not even just about peers. It's about the people you might one day be leading. What do they have to say about how well you come off in an interview as a future leader? All of that committee feedback um, gets joined together. The file gets looked at. It's a little bit bigger than just the, the CEO now. For a long time, it was split between Eric Schmidt, uh, Sergey Brin, and Larry Page. One of the three of them would always do that final round interview. Now it's a little bit wider um, of a team. They'll make the decision. But again, just like Automatic, they're looking way more at that committee feedback that comes from all these interviews than their own individual clicking. Now, lest you think this is just some weird thing for hipsters at, at Whole Foods and techie, well, actually, that's kind of the same community, isn't it? Now that we think about it. Um, this also works in industrial organizations. Steelscape is a prefabricated steel manufacturing company. They have trained all of their employees on how to do an interview. And when it comes time to hire, they have a process that starts with we screen out, we screen in resumes that'll be a fit. We bring people to a pre-orientation, uh, pre-orientation, meaning we're gonna give you the whole orientation of how we work as a company, but we haven't hired you yet. You're gonna go into interviews with a panel of the people you will be working the line with. There is someone from HR in the room, but they're really just there to make sure nobody asks illegal questions. Everybody else has been trained on doing the interview, and the people in that panel are the people that will become your future, uh, your future peers, your future coworkers. And that's what's amazing about all of these systems. They all have this in common that the people who work with new hires should be the ones deciding on whether or not they're hired. So much of your talent, your performance, in your own life, in the whole history of your career has been dependent upon the teams that you've been on. And so when we're looking at how do we judge whether or not somebody is gonna be a future performer with our organization, it just makes sense to involve that team. And it also, if it's not a fit, like I said, the Whole Foods thing seems mean, but let's be honest, if it's not a fit, it's probably a good idea to figure that out quickly and invite them to be successful somewhere else, right? even if it means sharing them with a the competition, because it's better for us as an organization and it's better for them. Now, uh, a lot of times I talk about this and I get a lot of responses from the HR people in the room, oh, we can't over our whole system. You're absolutely right, you probably can't. But can you bring like one extra person in that interview? Can you start small? Can you add one uh, extra person's voice? Maybe they don't have to be in the interview, but you're just adding uh, their feedback on resumes, whatever it is, whatever that small step you can take to bring those voices in, I think it's important to start taking that step and make this a gradual thing. Right? The number one thing we get with all of this, and I'll talk about it a bit more in a second, the number one response I get to a lot of different ideas is like, oh, we can't overhaul and do the whole thing. You're absolutely right, but you can take a step. You can start one little thing, right? And then we move forward from there. Speaking of that step, speaking of that one little thing that actually leads us into um, what we do once they're hired. How do we actually coach and manage performance? There's this weird trend, I don't know if you've heard about it, of ditching performance appraisals altogether. And all of the HR people in the room are terrified. <laughs> and all of the people that have ever gotten that Word document where you can only fill in like four of the boxes are like, amen, right? Well, I'll give you the spoiler before we dive into anything. We're not actually eliminating any and all forms of performance. What we're doing is teaching people how to coach to get better performance. Right? And we're deciding to use that time, talent, and energy towards a more meaningful way to improve performance. So all of the goals are still there. But we should talk about this. This is a trend that you're seeing more and more. And in my knowledge, it started probably, the, I don't know where it started, but the biggest, most notable firm to adopt the we're going to do away with all performance appraisal systems was a company you might have heard of called Adobe. Anybody heard of it? Anybody sent, emailed a PDF today? You've used Adobe, right? And Adobe is a fairly large tech company these days. I always think of them as a startup, but they're not. Tens of thousands of employees. They started at a time, um, those of you that, that got the AOL and CompuServe joke will remember this too. Do you remember when you used to have to buy software in a box? You remember that? It was like a size of a cereal box, right? It said Windows 95 on the front. Or if it's for your kids, it said, where in the world is Carmen San Diego, right? And you used to have to go to like Circuit City <laughs> Do you remember Circuit City, right? Um, you used to have to go to one of those big electronic retailer stores and, and uh, you would want to get there as quickly as possible because the new update is here 
and we're gonna, we're gonna fix all of the bugs from before. But of course, there's still bugs because otherwise you won't get next year's, right? But so we're gonna storm, I mean, you used to see these videos of people when Windows 95 came out, storming Circuit City to get their cereal box with, with one floppy disk about this big in the box. Never really understood that. What's the giant box about? Uh, of course, nowadays, people don't even understand what the floppy disk is about. I have, a, I have a seven-year-old son, and he was playing around with my computer. Did you know, I mean, the save button on your computer, I don't care what operating system you have, is still a picture of a floppy disk. And my son asked me the other day, what does that symbol mean? <laughs> and I had to explain to him, like, well, back in the day, there was... And, and I, at one point, I just simply said, well, it's the save button. And he goes, well, why isn't it a picture of a cloud? <laughs> Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's out of the mouth of babes. Um, Adobe was one of the first companies to move their whole software thing over to a cloud-based system as well. They moved to what they call the Adobe Creative Suite. It's a subscription now. You decide which Adobe products you want, and you just pay an ongoing subscription fee. We'll update it whenever we can fix a bug. We'll continuously update it. And while you don't have to stand in the freezing cold waiting for Circuit City to open to get your cereal box anymore, you do have to deal with your computer wanting to update like every four days, right? And restarting while you're in the middle of a conference call and all of that sort of stuff. But overall, in terms of improving the system, it, it works a whole lot faster. And that led, Adobe was one of the early adopters of this, that led them to look at everything else in their processes and decide what else are we doing on an annual basis or a regularly scheduled basis that should be in the cloud, that should be a subscription, that should be ongoing. And no surprise, performance appraisals came up very, very quickly. So what Adobe decided to do was ditch the entire thing after a huge uh, company-wide survey about what to do. They decided to ditch the entire thing and take the tens of thousands of hours that are spent filling out that form, deciding who's an A, B, and C player, or negotiating with your peer manager who, you're like, I need, I need an extra A player this year. Can I trade you two Cs for an A? It's like the NFL draft, right? Um, they reframed all of that and replaced it, and they taught their managers how to coach for improved performance. The system that they use is a system they call check-ins. And a check-in is any conversation between a manager and a subordinate can be as little as 10 minutes. Most of the time, the only thing that gets documented is that the check-in happened. If there's a legal reason to document something else, then, then we, we document that too. But most of the conversation is off the record. It counts as a check-in if three things are discussed. Expectations, feedback, and growth and development. As long as you hit all three of these points in, in one discussion with them, that's a check-in you have checked in. We want you to do it much more frequently than once a year. The standard is, you know, like expectation is about once a quarter. Most people do it once a month, right? Once a week is kind of overkill. Uh, but they do it on a much more frequent basis. Now, expectations refers to um, the tracking, setting, and reviewing of clear objectives, right? What are your objectives for this period? and uh, what do we expect of you, and also what can you expect of us, what resources do you need for all of that. Uh, feedback, this I think is, is key and brilliant, is the giving but also receiving of ongoing feedback and coaching. So in other words, I'm not only gonna say, based on our expectations from last time, here's how you're performing, I'm also gonna say, how am I doing? What am I, what am I forgetting to get you that you need in order to do your job well? It's a conversation, and a giving and receiving of feedback on how well are we doing. And then growth and development is an opportunity to talk about future opportunities. It's cool. You can take a picture. That's cool. <laughs> Most of the time, I kid you not, Jalisha can testify. Last, last week, somebody started taking a picture of this, and I thought, that, that doesn't serve any purpose. You have to have the whole thing. So then I presented the whole thing, and they shushed me because I was standing in the way of the slide. <laughs> I got this from like multiple members of the audience. So it's cool. I'm very excited to see I'm not getting shushed today. Growth and development, the opportunity to talk about opportunities. Now, here's why I think the, the undocumented nature of this conversation is so important. Because let's be honest, when you're doing that annual performance review system, what does everyone want to be one day? A manager, right? What is everyone's five-year plan? To be promoted, right? Everybody sort of talks a good game, but life happens. And it happens and it changes much more quickly than on an annual cycle, right? So as a manager, wouldn't you want to know that, yeah, some of your employees are planning on going to grad school in six months? One of your employee's wife got a new job in a different city, and now they're moving in two months. But they're willing to give you everything that they have for the next two months, and then they're gone, right? Or maybe they're like, yeah, I, I like my job. I don't plan on moving any time. 
my opportunity to talk about opportunities is I'm happy where I am and I don't want to play the whole I want to get promoted and be the future leader of the organization game. You can't really have that conversation unless there's a level of trust that I think most of the time only happens when it's, when it's an undocumented level of trust, when you can have that candid conversation, right? Um, I was beneficial enough to be on the receiving end of this. Maybe this is why I'm biased. Right before I left to go back to graduate school, uh, I was working it for a pharmaceutical company, and one of my peers became my boss, which is always awkward, let's just be honest. But because we had five years of working together, I had an, he and I had enough candor where I could say, hey, listen, I should probably let you know I've been accepted into school, it starts in August, I'm, I'm leaving. You have me for like three months, but if you're interviewing anybody for a different position in the territory, you should probably think about them for my position too, it's gonna be open in three months, right? And that's a type of conversation that so often happens like off over here where it's even taboo to talk about. What if we opened it up and said, look, we're, we're interested in talking about any future opportunities. We're interested in getting you um, what you need, right? We're interested in providing you uh, enough, enough pay, enough learning opportunities, et cetera, so that we hope you'll be here forever, but you're also really qualified if you, if you decide to go somewhere else, right? It used to be People used to come to work, you pick your company right out of college or high school, you work there for 40 years, they give you a gold watch and a pension program, right? Some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? Because now the average tenure is four to five years and declining, the watch is gold plated, and <laughs> funny, thing, <laughs> funny thing about your pension, uh, right? It's a little bit different, and so we can only have these opportunities, these, these conversations, when we're willing to have a level of candor that's a little bit different. Now, how did this work for Adobe? It worked, it worked pretty well. Overall morale increased. There was a decrease in employees quitting by about 30%, but an increase in involuntary departures. This is another euphemism. This is, you didn't want to leave, but we wanted you to leave, <laughs> right? Because let's be honest, on an annual cycle, you can hide poor performance for like 10 months, can't you, right? Um, <laughs> increases in productivity, increases in revenue. Why? I think the big reason beyond just that level of candor, the big reason is perspective, right? In an, in an annual system, let's be fair, we're actually only really judging like the last two or three months of performance because we forgot to document for like four or five, right? But in an, an, even if it is a, a full sort of annual system, we know that feedback, which was the goal of performance appraisals, feedback is an incredibly valuable tool for improving performance, but it has to be delivered relatively close to the moment that it happened, and it has to be delivered with suggestions and improvements and, and that sort of thing. If you're just documenting it, and we'll talk about it in a couple months, that's not really improving performance, right? I love being able to speak in places like Oklahoma because I can use my favorite analogy, which is football, right? There's part of, parts of the country that don't have like even their little kids playing football. It's, they play that other football, right? Football. Uh, actually, we're the ones with the terrible name, right? Because it's not actually a ball. You don't use your feet. It's an egg that you throw with your hands. But hand egg is a terrible name for a sport. So, but in football, think about this. What we're doing with an annual system most often is we're asking people to get out there and play a football game. And at halftime, we'll talk about what we need to change. But you can't know the score. You can't know how you're developing. How do you turn something around, right? We talk so often about it's every football game ever. Watch, we are 68 days away from, or 68 hours away from college football. You can tell, I'm counting, right? We're six, and at the, end, at the end of every first half, what does every news, every sports channel do? They interview the coaches, what are you gonna change? What are you gonna change? What are you gonna change? Because feedback delivered in the moment can turn something around. You get that sort of Al Pacino, any given Sunday speech, and suddenly everybody's turned around, right? We're basically saying, play your first half, and a year from now, we'll tell you how you did. But good luck in the second half, right? So switching from annual to this ongoing, in the moment feedback, works a whole lot better. The other reason we should talk about this, by the way, um, is why well, I like to call it the M word. You ever heard the M word? Millennial. It's weird. Everybody likes to talk about like the millennials are coming. They're all already here, by the way. <laughs> They're in the room. They're among us, right? Now we should talk about the way the workplace has to change for, for Gen Z, but we still haven't really adapted. Everybody wants to talk about how to adapt to millennials, right? Um, and nobody wants to decide who exactly millennials are, what ages there are, et cetera, right? Like, my, fr my friend Scott Stratton has this great um, definition of millennials. He doesn't use dates. He doesn't use, like, 1980 to whatever. He says, millennials are people younger than us, and we don't like you. <laughs> but we should talk about millennials. We should talk about Gen Z. We should talk about Gen AA. 
um, whatever we're going to do, we're as bad as institutional investor in terms of picking generational names, aren't we? Um, we should talk about it. These, this is a group of people. This is a group of employees, a group of current college students, a group of your future leaders and managers. This is a group of people that were soaked in feedback from an early, early age, right? So I don't know about you, when I was playing video games, you used to go to a place and put a quarter in, right? And then when you died, you had to put another quarter in, right? Or maybe you got like three lives, but it was always limited. And so you, you played it safe. Now they get this ongoing feedback in how they play the games because you could just take this huge risk and if it doesn't work, you, um, I think the word is respawn. Is that the word? Yeah, he's like, yeah, that's the word. You respawn <laughs> back where you were and you get to start again. So you get to keep trying stuff and you get immediate feedback on whether or not it worked, right? Then you go into a, a, a schooling system where you're given standardized tests all of the time. You're given, I, I remember, I don't know if you're this way, I feel like we only got report cards like once, maybe twice a year. Now I'm a parent of a second grader. I feel like I'm signing off on some progress report like every couple of weeks. Right? Or there's some new test that they took. I'm like, great, you scored great on that thing we didn't know was coming. Right? But we're constantly judging their performance. They, get into a, they go to college. They get into a learning management system in college where your grade is updated in real time. At any given time, you can see whether or not you're doing it. There's a big debate among professors, by the way. Some of the, the nice ones like to say that you start with an A, and then depending on performance, we go down. Others say you start with an F, and you go up. Right? But regardless, at any given time, you can see how you're doing. Most of our students. Correct me if I'm wrong. They go take the final now, and they know exactly how many questions they have to get right to lock in their B minus. <laughs> you thought I was going to say A, didn't you? No. <laughs> the A students want to get as many questions right as possible. It's, it's the smart students that want to lock in that B minus and then focus on some other class, right? <clears throat> But anyway, they're, they're soaked in feedback at, at every level. And then we throw them into a corporate system where we're like, here's your job. We've trained you on your job. We'll check in with you in a year. How well is that working? And the truth is, if we're being honest, even those of you that are boomers or greatest generation, if you're, if you're still here, um, <laughs> that's so mean. I got I to gotta dish it out equally, though. I apologize in advance, but I have to re-engage the millennials in the room now because they all hate me, and they're going to say mean things on Twitter and Instaface. So I have to re-engage all of them. <laughs> But even if you're, the, if, if you're of the older generations, right, let's be honest, you probably would have appreciated feedback going on more often, right? It's not that they're, er well, they, okay, they are arrogant, but they're also right about this issue of feedback. They just have the, let's call it narcissism, to ask for it right away, right? And we'll deal with the whole you want a promotion of three days thing, but we can deal with it. <laughs> We can deal with it a whole lot sooner if we're giving ongoing repetitive feedback, right? So these conversations work way better. Now, there are times where you have to, in that conversation about growth and development, you have to register that, yes, that person is leaving. They're going somewhere else. And you are basically, at that moment, you're faced with two decisions, right? You can, decision one, you can decide to celebrate their departure and talk about how we're going to keep in touch. Decision two, you can send them the security guard in the box. Anybody ever got the security guard in the box, by the way? You know what I'm talking about, right? <clears throat> I got the virtual version of the security guard in the box one time. I quit a company that was geographically dispersed, so I worked out of the home. I sent an email saying, this will be my official two-week resignation. I got a call on the phone 38 minutes later, and as soon as I started talking to my manager, I could tell that he was reading. You know what I mean? Have you ever been on the phone? You could tell somebody's just reading through the legally approved, compliance approved, uh, I, what is it, debarkation? I don't know what you call that, right? Deorientation papers, right? Just reading through the whole thing about how we're going to, all this sort of stuff. And I looked at him, I was like, whoa, 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 I can tell you're reading. Why don't you just send this checklist to me in an email, and I'll get it done, and I'll let you know when I'm done. He said, oh, I can't do that. Well, why not? Well, we shut off your email 37 minutes ago. <laughs> I gave my two weeks notice. I lost my email access two minutes later, right? That was the virtual version of the security guard in the box. And, and the weird thing about this is almost every organization, let's be fair, is structured as an up or out organization. It's just the nature, it's like physics, right? We have this org chart, it gets narrower at the top, therefore not everyone can get to the top. Some people are gonna leave. And yet often we treat them when they hit that exit as, as like betrayers, as oh, you're done with us, we're, we're, you're dead to me now, et cetera, right? 
Um, and it's a weird message. And even if we don't do it officially, our, our policies, our procedures, et cetera, send that message that the relationship is over. But the truth is the relationship's never over. Let's be fair. I'm willing to bet a couple people in this room came into this room today and found someone they used to work with and got to have that conversation. It happens in almost every meeting where multiple different professionals from different organizations are coming. Why is that? Well, it's because when most people hit the exit, what they really do is they hit the network. Every organization in, exists inside of a larger network, a network of other companies, vendors, suppliers, competitors, partners, clients, et cetera. And most people, when they leave, unless they're nerdy like me and they decide to leave an industry and go to graduate school, most of the time they went somewhere else in the network. And we might think that they're taking all the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we invested in them and they're taking it to a competitor. But the truth is, we've seen this in multiple different studies, information flow actually goes both ways. The easiest way to track this is in engineering. We can see it in patent filings. An engineer leaves firm A, she goes over to firm B. Yes, in firm B, there are now patent filings that cite patents from firm A. We can see the knowledge, skills, and abilities from firm A bleeding over into B. But the weird thing is that firm A starts citing firm B's patents more often too, right? Because that, that relationship is still in play. It's happening at an informal level most often because people get that you're stepping somewhere in the network. And smart organizations are figuring out that maybe we should keep this relationship at a formal level too. Maybe we should treat people who leave not like they're betrayers or departers, we should treat them like alumni, right? And, and relate to them the same way alumni of a university will. Now there's a couple organizations that do this really, really well. Um, my favorite example, because m m this is pretty much where you go to find former employees anyway, um, is a company called LinkedIn. LinkedIn got to the point that every startup gets to where they basically realize they have more former employees than current employees and they should probably be benefiting from that. So they created a network uh, on, on the LinkedIn platform, which is smart if you got it, use it, um, that is two-tiered. The first tier is all-inclusive. Everybody who left on, on good terms, I should be fair, there are some people who left the organization and we have no interest in keeping in touch with them, right? <laughs> But everybody who left on good terms, everybody whose departure wasn't celebrated, let's put it that way, um, these are people that we want to keep in touch with. So everybody is invited to that all-inclusive network. Then depending on what firm or what level in the firm you were or how well you engage in the all-inclusive, you actually get invited into another tier that is an invitation-only tier that actually can bring you back on on campus at LinkedIn for focus groups that solicits your opinions about certain things. Sometimes it might even turn into you coming back three or four years later into the organization. It's an idea of like, we value our relationship with you so much, we still wanna think of you as a member of the organization, even if you're getting paid somewhere else. And obviously you have to check these things and make sure that trade secrets and that sort of stuff aren't linking out, but most of the time we're talking about little pieces of feedback. We're talking about what are you seeing in the same industry that we're in? What are, what are you seeing in the network that's changing that, that we're not seeing? And we can also tell you what we're seeing and so both people benefit. A number of other firms do this. Accenture, the consulting firm. Now this one makes perfect sense because anytime you're a consulting firm, you, you're gonna be an upper out environment and your out people, let's be honest, are gonna be a source of new clients. But the other thing that, that happens, they run this uh, thing called the uh, Accenture talent pool. They help them find other jobs. And then inbound, they offer the employee referral bonus to ex-employees. You know the employee, most organizations have it. You're a current employee. We love you, so we would love to work with your friends. You make the referral, and instead of paying a headhunter, we'll pay you a couple thousand dollars or whatever it is, right? What Accenture's genius is, we're gonna extend that to former employees too. If you left in good terms, and now you're somewhere else in another organization, talking to somebody who's getting their performance review done only once a year and really hates it and is really dissatisfied, you know what good talent over here looks like, you know what a good fit looks like, you're actually a better ambassador for new employees to our company than current employees are because you're somewhere else. So why wouldn't we want to incentivize you to let us know about people you think might be a fit, right? It makes perfect sense. Um, there are a, a number of different organizations that keep this up and the thing that I get most often is like, oh great, well LinkedIn obviously can build a huge uh, alumni network because they're this huge tech company, right? I mean, Accenture's a global, what can I do in my small thing, right? Or I'm just a manager, I don't have the authority to overhaul our whole system, what can I do? Could you throw a, a lunch once a year and email a lot of your former people that you were a manager of and say, hey, I just, just wanna check in and see how you're doing, we're gonna throw this day where we get everybody back together, we're just gonna throw our own little reunion, right? You can do that at any level, 
right? You gotta be careful what you say some of the time because if you don't have the blessing of, of everybody, then you gotta be a little bit more careful, but you can still make that gesture. You could quite simply reach back out to people that were former employees of yours, former managers of yours, and send them simple emails like, hey, I was thinking about you the other day because some guy at some lunch was talking about reaching back out to former colleagues, and I just, just wanted to know I was thinking about you. I hope you're doing well. And then let the conversation go from there. You'd be amazed what information comes up in those conversations, how helpful it can be, how much more honest of a conversation you can have a lot of times with those former employees about challenges that they're having, you're having, et cetera. Uh, but the truth is, we need to be doing something about this, especially, to be frank, in, in smaller communities like ours, it's a very small world. It's the reason I knew that some of you ran into former colleagues of yours here is that I live in Tulsa too. It's a very small world. You're gonna have that system in place. And your best ambassadors, the way to be a great place to work is to be a great place to have worked as well. To have an organization that still believes in you, celebrates you, et cetera, even if you decided that your opportunities lie elsewhere. Again, so long as you left on good opportunities and we weren't deliberately trying to share you with the competition. Now at this point, I know what you might be thinking, right? We've talked for 51 minutes according to my clock, which is important because Jalisha told me I have to go for exactly 51 minutes for you to get your CMEs, so that's good. We've talked about all this and you're probably thinking like either, oh my gosh, this is amazing or wow, there's no way we could do any of that, right? You're probably, we're now at that point where you're thinking, how do I take some of this back and apply this, et cetera? How do I make this work in my company? And, and I'll give you the example that I think about most often, but I'll warn you, I'm a total nerd. And the example is this, the internal combustion engine. You didn't see that one coming, did you? He said nerd, you didn't think I meant like nerd. I'm a huge like Mythbusters nerd. Phys I only took one class in physics and I don't remember a lot of it, but it helped me figure out shows like Mythbusters. One of the things I remember from it is that the internal combustion engine is only 30% efficient. Those of you that are actual engineers are like, yep, that's exactly right. 30% of the energy stored in a gallon of gasoline gets translated into forward motion. The rest is lost to heat and friction and stuff I don't understand, but you could probably explain. Um, I see you nodding your head. You could probably explain, I don't get it. But it's lost, right? And if you think about it, right, most organizations, the internal combustion engine is only 30% efficient. It's charged with taking stored energy, translating it into forward motion. You think about it, one of the things that we celebrate all the time are the tinkerers, the, the people that are manipulating the engine, manipulating transportation, trying to find ways to get more forward motion or to move more people with the same level of stored energy. We celebrate that all the time. But if you think about it, what is an organization? When an organization is charged with taking resources, human capital, taking all of that, turning it into value for customers, shareholders, stakeholders, et cetera. We're the same way. But unlike Frederick Taylor's day, the fuel running most organizations, it's not labor anymore, it's mental energy. One of the best indications we have of how well we're capturing mental energy and translating it into value for an organization is what we call the employee engagement scores. Those of you in HR are like, oh yeah, I know about employee engagement all the time. You also know the depressing tale. Worldwide employee engagement is about 18%. 18% of people say that they bring their whole selves, their whole knowledge, skills, and abilities, that they're fully engrossed in the task that they're at. This should depress you more than the internal combustion engine. And in the same way, we should probably celebrate the tinkerers, the people that are trying to innovate the factory to get a little bit more engagement. I'm not a naive optimist. I don't believe that if you suddenly start hiring as a team and ditch your performance appraisal and replace it with coaching and celebrate departures, that suddenly you're gonna to get to 100% engagement and everything is gonna be amazing in your organization and you'll be on the cover of Bloomberg Business Week. I don't, I don't believe that's gonna happen. But I'm obsessed with getting this number a little bit higher. And I have two sons, there's seven and five, which means I have about a decade to get this number higher, right? And I don't think we're gonna get to 100%, but like, if we could get to 50, if one of my sons could enjoy his job, right? I'm cool with that. I'll deal with, I'll pay for counseling for the other one. But if we could get, if we could get one, right? But if as a, as a parent, like if it's unacceptable to think about the odds that your child is gonna get fully engaged in the organization, that their full knowledge, skills, and abilities are gonna get leveraged, that they feel like they can be themselves and bring their whole selves to work. If you're looking at a 20% chance for your own kids, isn't that a little depressing? And I hate to sound cliche, but everybody's somebody's kid, right? The people that are in your charge right now are that same way. Isn't it a little depressing if we think about this? So all of our focus needs to be, in my opinion, on this. And it may not take the form of huge overhauls like Adobe, but as I was saying with hiring as a team, what if we start small? What if we find little tweaks? 
We may not be able to build a whole uh, alumni network, but what if we start with checking back in on a regular basis with our former employees, our former colleagues? We may not be able to overhaul and hire as a whole team, but we can bring one extra voice in. We can start small, we can continue to tinker. Just like we celebrate the people that are trying to reinvent transportation, we need to be celebrating people, continuously celebrating people that are trying to innovate their factories and trying to move forward. It was our guiding idea for the whole day, by the way, that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. And so now I kick it over to you and it's your question, the question of application. What are we doing, even if it's the smallest thing we can do, what are we doing to innovate our factory, to get our people a little bit more engaged? What are we doing to help celebrate talent wherever it is and celebrate the contributions of teams? What, what are we doing? Great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. What are you doing moving forward to innovate your factory? Thank you all so much for having me.